Hello and welcome fellow coders. In my last tutorial video, you have learned how to create and run Go routines. What you haven't learned though is how to share data between these Go routines. And that is exactly where channels come into play. Channels are used to send and receive data throughout your code base. So you can think of them as some kind of data transportation pipeline, usually between processes running in Go routines. But before you continue with this tutorial video, make sure that you fully understand what concurrency is and how Go routines work, because both of these topics are very important for this tutorial. So so if you haven't watched my last one, make sure to check it out. You can find it right here. Okay, now without further ado, let's get into channels. First, let's have a look at this very simple example. The gopher function simply prints out the string gopher. Within the main function, we call the gopher function in the go routine. And while running the code, you can see that nothing gets printed out. Well, to fix this problem and make your code wait until the gopher function has been called, we could again use a wait group like we did in the last tutorial about go routines. This time though, I will show you how you can use channels for that. Now, so far the gopher function simply prints out one word, but what if we wanted to communicate this gopher string back to the main function and print it out in there? Simply returning it wouldn't work, since the gopher function gets started in a go routine, thus in a separate process to the main function running in the main go routine. This is exactly where channels come into play. So in order to get the value of the gopher function back to another process, we will be using channels. To do that, let's first create a new channel. In Go, channels are a basic type, same as slices and maps. And same as slices and maps, they can also be created using the make function. In addition to that, channels are typed by the data type that gets transported. So in order to create a channel, you need to provide a data type as well. This channel C now can only be used to transport string values from A to B. The type of a channel can be anything. It can also be an integer or a struct that you defined, or it can even be an interface if you want to have a general kind of channel. But for the sake of this tutorial, Let's stick to string. What we will do now is, we will pass this channel to the gopher function. Within the function, we need to extend the parameter list by the string channel. Now, instead of printing out the gopher string, we will use the channel to send the string back and we can do this by using the following syntax. This particular operator is called receiver operator, whereas this whole line is called send statement. See how this arrow is pointing from the value into the channel, showing that the data is getting sent into the channel. This is an easy way to remember it. So what we have done so far is that we have used a channel to put data into it, but now it's time to get the data out of the channel. In our main function, we can take the channel and use the same operator to read data out of it. Again, have a look at the direction of the arrow. While reading data, the arrow points out of the channel into a variable definition. Easy to remember, right? Now the last thing we need to do is to print out the value b, and then we will be able to run the code and see if it works. Well, it does. Amazing. But why exactly is that so? Why is using channels a way to make sure that the main function waits for the gopher function to complete before printing out the value? Well, it is important to understand that sending and receiving are blocking operations. If you want to send a value into the channel, the channel will wait and block the code until there is a receiver there that is able to receive the value. Similarly, if you want to receive a value, the channel will block until there is a value that is being sent over the channel. Since in our case we have a receiver and a value that gets sent over the channel, the value gets printed out. Now let's recap what we have done so far. We send data from a function running in a goroutine to the main function, which under the hood also runs in a goroutine. So basically we send data from one goroutine to another. Awesome, right? Now let's see what happens if we send multiple messages into the channel. For that, let's quickly wrap this part into a for loop, which will iterate five times, and therefore send the gopher string into the channel five times. We would expect that every single message that gets sent into the channel by the gopher function would actually be received and printed out by the main function, right? Well, by running the code, we can see that this is actually not the case. Gopher gets only printed out once, but why is that the case? Well, even though the gopher string gets put into the channel five times, we only have one receiving call that fetches the string out of the channel. This is why the value gets printed out exactly one time. A common practice is to put the receiving call into an infinite loop. This makes sure that, no matter how many messages get sent over the channel, there will always be a receiving call. Let's go ahead and run this and see what happens. The good news is, gopher gets printed out 5 times. The bad news is though, the code crashes saying that we ran into a deadlock. That is because we are running the receiving calls in an infinite loop, which tries to receive another message after the initial 5 have been sent and blocks the code afterwards. One way of fixing this problem would be to replace the infinite loop by a for loop, which also iterates 5 times. This can be done if you know exactly how many messages get sent over the channel, which is usually not the case. So the infinite loop is a loop of choice. A second and much better way of dealing with that is to close the channel after all messages have 
have been sent. Closing the channel will prevent a deadlock, which you will see in a minute, but actually opens up a different problem. To make it more visible, let's sleep the process for 500 milliseconds. This way, you will have a better chance of seeing what is going to happen. If I run the code now, I want you to pay close attention to what is going on. Did you see it? First, the five messages got received and printed out. After that, the receiving GoRoutine still receives messages, which are the zero value of the type of the channel. In our case, that's the empty string. So we saw that closing a channel prevents a deadlock, but does not prevent the receiver from receiving indefinitely. But the good thing is, Go has something up its sleeves that we can use to get around that. We can use a second value that the receiver operator gives us, which tells us if the channel is still open or not. This gives us the opportunity to break the loop if the channel has been closed by the sender. See, running the code will now receive and print out gopher exactly 5 times. The channel gets closed, the infinite loop breaks and the main function finishes. Awesome, right? The next thing I would like to show you is the concept of a buffer channel. First, let me print out some messages that will make it more obvious what is happening. This way, we will know when the message will be sent and after a message has been sent. In the main function, we will wait 2 seconds right before we start the receiving loop. And again, print out some messages that will help us see what is happening. Before I run the code, I would like you to again pay close attention. Did you see it? You could see pretty well that first, waiting gets printed out, followed by the sending output. Then the code stopped for a bit and the working part began, which started by receiving the message and the follow-up sending calls. What happened here is that the for loop in the gopher function was able to send one gopher string into the channel, but then the code blocked and waited for a receiving call. Only after the message has been read from the channel, the next message could be sent into the channel. That is because we are working with an unbuffered channel. Let me first show you how the output looks like for a buffer channel. This will make the difference very clear. To create a buffer channel, all you need to do is to provide the buffer capacity of the channel into the make function. For simplicity's sake, I will create a channel with a buffer of 2. When I run the code, again, pay close attention to what is happening. Actually, let me open up a separate terminal next to the first one so you can see it much better. See, this time two messages got sent into the channel before the third message blocked the for loop. So the difference between an unbuffered and a buffered channel is pretty obvious now. When using an unbuffered channel, the sender has to wait for the receiver to take the message out of the channel before he is able to put in another message. When, on the other hand, using a buffered channel, the sender is indeed able to put in more messages into the channel before the receiver takes out the messages. The number of the messages that can be queued depends on the capacity of the channel. Speaking of queues, that is exactly what buffered channels are used for. A buffered channel lets you queue up jobs or tasks by a job scheduler. While the scheduler is scheduling the jobs, Workers, which are running in separate GoRoutines, can use the incoming messages and process them. But the job scheduler does not have to wait for the worker to complete his job before he can schedule the next one. He can simply put it on top of the queue and the worker will process it as soon as he is done with the previous job. Using this kind of worker queues can greatly improve the performance of your code. Now for the last part that I'm going to show you, I need to get rid of this code. The first thing that I need is a function which will run indefinitely and simply writes messages into a channel. Let's just call it send and it will take two arguments. First the milliseconds to wait between the send operations and the second argument will be the channel the messages will get sent to. Within the function, first let us sleep for the given time period and then put the message into the channel for how long the process has slept. You will see in a minute why this will help us to identify the different calls. Now the last thing we need is a for loop and we are good to go. In our main function, let's create two separate channels, one of which will receive messages after 200 milliseconds and the other one will receive messages after one second. Next, let's go ahead and start two go routines, both with their own arguments. The first go routine will send messages every 200 milliseconds, whereas the second one will do so every second. Lastly, let's start a for loop which will receive the sent messages and simply print them out. But looking at this code, you might already be able to spot the problem. Let's first run it and see what will happen. What's happening here is that, since both of these received calls are getting called one after another, the longer one will block the faster one, even though the faster Go routine would be able to send messages more frequently. To get around that, Golang provides us with a solution that helps us receive messages from whatever channel is ready to receive. For that, we can use the SELECT statement. Using the SELECT statement in this syntax right here, we can now print out messages as soon as they are put into a channel. And the good thing is, no matter which channel gets a message, it gets read without blocking the other one. See, the faster running GoRoutine is able to send multiple messages before the slower GoRoutine is sending his message. That is how you can process different messages from different channels without blocking each other. And that is it for today's video. I hope that you have seen how easy it is to use channels to share data between different Go routines and how easy it is to write concurrent code in Go. Concurrent code in Go. <laughs>
Speaking of Golang, unfortunately, this is my last video in my Golang tutorial beginner series. But on the bright side, if you've watched all of them, you are now a Go master and should be able to build your own projects. If you want to learn more advanced topics of Go, you can have a look into my playlist. You will learn more complex topics like how to write generic code or how to write proper tests. You can find it right here. Now, all good things must come to an end. But after 15 episodes, it kind of makes me sad. But it also makes me extremely happy. Because after reading all these positive comments, I feel like all the time and energy that I put into this, it was well worth it. So if you got something out of this series and feel like giving something little back, you can support my channel by either buying me a coffee or becoming a member on Patreon. I will leave links to both of these pages in the description. Every single bit helps and is so much appreciated. This way I can continue creating content for free for you to learn from and to enjoy. And until next time, keep on coding.